Welcome to The Long Way Round. My name's Malcolm Byrne, and for the next two hours, I will be your host on a provocative musical journey, I'm sure. Uh, this week's guest is uh, none other than Professor Richard Wolf. And uh, Richard, uh, before he joins me on the show, uh, Richard had sent a list of songs that he would like played during the show. And I'm going to start off with a special request of Richard's. This is the International as performed by Pete Seeger for you here on The Longer Round. So stay tuned for Richard Wolf coming up right after this. Debout les dames de la terre Debout les forces de la fin La raison ton au centre à terre C'est l'éruption de la fin Du passé fait en temple rasa Pour l'espoir debout, debout Le monde up you prisoners of hunger the world is changing at the base we who have been nothing will be everything of the past we shall make a clean slate still peak French though he says it's the final battle And he says, we need no supreme saviors, no God, no Caesar. Producers, save yourselves. Heat up your own forge. Soufflant nous même notre forge. Blow upon the forge and make it hot. Beat on the iron while it is hot. Il n'est pas de sorte suprême, ni Dieu, ni César, ni Tribun. Producte, sauvons-nous nous-mêmes, décrétant le salut commun. Pour que le voleur en de gorge porterait l'esprit du cachot. Soufflant nous-mêmes à notre forge, battant le fer quand il est chaud. C'est le lieu. Final, group on nous et demain. L'international sera le genre romain. C'est le lieu final, group on nous et demain. L'international sera le genre romain. That's a fitting introduction, the international, the uh, internationally recognized theme song of the working classes the world over, as sung by Pete Seeger. I thought that set the tone for the show very well. Uh, professor uh, Richard D. Wolf is professor of economics emeritus, University of Massachusetts, Amherst and a visiting professor in the graduate program in international affairs of the New School University, New York City. He's the founder of Democracy at Work and host of their nationally syndicated show, Economic Update. His latest book is The Sickness of the System When Capitalism Fails to Save Us from Pandemics or Itself, which can be found along with his other books, Understanding Socialism and Understanding Marxism at www.democracyatwork.com. Dot info and if you uh, haven't uh, watched Richard's YouTube updates, it, it's always very revealing and informative. And and as you'll you'll hear him discuss 
uh, many of the subjects that he's uh, concerned with on the show. So without further ado, here is the interview with Professor Richard Wolff, which we uh, conducted earlier this week. Hello, how are you? Very well. Uh, should I call you Professor or Richard or Rick? <laughs> what do you prefer? Rick is fine. Okay, Rick. I'm very, very grateful to have you as a guest. I've been following you for a long time and and uh, always feel uh, not necessarily better, but at least more enlightened when I listen to you speak. <laughs> right. All right. <laughs> so thanks, thanks for being on the show. How are you? Well, I don't know. I, uh, I wish I knew. I... I... I'm optimistic. I always was. I remain so. But it is becoming more difficult because of the combination of accumulating problems uh, that I see all around me. And that is coupled with a level of denial about the problems I see all around me. It's more the denial than anything else that scares me. Yeah, I, so, I thoroughly understand. And as I, I said, there are there are very few, uh, your voice certainly is included, voices of what I would call sanity and reason in the public discourse. And I hope that that remains the case. I, some of the people that I've been listening to have been deplatformed. For example, you know, they've had their YouTube channels either blocked or shut down just because, you know, there's certain things you're not, um, I guess you're just not supposed to talk about anymore. Right. <laughs> like what's really going on. I have a few questions jotted down, and, and I, I know you're you're only here for an hour, so I, I don't want to uh, bog things down too much, but I know enough about you to know that you're basically a self-described Marxist. If you could just explain the fundamental differences between communism and socialism in your words, particularly during these times of, of kind of a renewed Cold War where there's sort of a sense that, uh, well, those old Cold War mentality seems to have seeped back into the situation. So, Yeah, it it's never lurking that far below the surface that a little scratching can't bring it out. Okay, I'd be glad to. Um Basically, Marxism, socialism, communism are very simple propositions. Um, they've been developed and extended and by all kinds of interesting people. But at base, all that the socialists and communists have ever really been about, and the Marxists too, has been they've articulated a kind of yearning, a yearning that is best described as thinking that there could be and that therefore there should be a better world than the one we live in. That somehow the human race is a sophisticated enough, developed enough, smart enough that it should have been able quite some time ago to at least do away with those problems and difficulties that we can solve so that we can concentrate our energies on those that where we're not so sure. Um, and that's really it. And, and for them, the system that they've blamed, if you like, was the system they lived in. I mean, these are not people who, who did anything more complicated than say, look, um, I go to work each day, I shop for my groceries, I drive my car, I try to raise my kids. But things could go better for all of us than this system is delivering to us. That's it. And I want somehow to figure that out. I want to go beyond that. And let me give examples that many people can identify with it. Throughout the history of slavery, there were all kinds of people who, particularly slaves, but not only the slaves, who said, wow, life could be better than what it is. And over time, they developed ideas based on this. For example, that nobody should be the property of another person, that that somehow 
demeans a human being in a way that is not only awful for the slave, but it isn't good for the master either to, to be cut off from the people you might be a friend of, uh, a parent of, a lover of, because of some artificial rule that says, I'm your property, sort of like a cow or a piece of furniture. And so the history of slavery, if you do any research, is full of people who wanted to do better. And they had different ways of saying it. For example, uh, all men are created equal. That's one way of saying it. Mm. If we're all equal, then some of us can't be slaves of others of us. So that was, a, here's another one, freedom. I believe in freedom. Well, if you scratch that, what it meant was, I think we can do better than slavery, and I'm in favor of trying to do something differently so that we aren't divided into masters and slaves. And then there were 50 other ways of doing it. And then over time, when it didn't change, people said, wait a minute, this is intolerable. And now we're going from a yearning to a demand. This is not tolerable. And then they did it. They had revolt, revolts, slave revolts, and they had revolutions, and they had slaves who ran away into the forest where they could set up a different kind of community and try to experiment with a community in which there were no masters and slaves, and that wasn't a lot. And you know, many of these experiments didn't work out real well. They fell to fighting amongst themselves, or they didn't, but one of the masters got together a posse and ran after them into the forest, or they had trouble raising enough food. So many of the experiments, we have only the vaguest traces of because they disappeared. Now, why am I telling you this? Because the yearning to go beyond capitalism, and let me tell you why it became real easy to feel that way. If you look at slavery, you see something unless you're blind, that goes r roughly like this. A really small percentage of the people are masters, and a very large percentage of the people are slaves. And by and large, the slaves do most of the work. They certainly do the unpleasant, hard, difficult, dangerous work. And that system existed for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Another system we know of historically is feudalism, okay? And feudalism, you know, you remember from your uh, Knights of the Round Table movies, there's a small group of people, they're called lords, and then a vast group of people, those are called serfs, and the lords tell the serfs what to do. The serfs are not slaves, you can't buy them and sell them the way you could with a slave, but you notice it's a small group of people controlling, dominating, and becoming rich off of the work of a large group. And now an awful lot of people noticed, as I hope listeners to this show, if they haven't already, will notice that capitalism has something frighteningly similar. Yeah, there are different. We have a tiny group of people we call employers. Less than 1% of the population of the United States is an employer. The vast majority of us are employees. And you know something? That looks a lot like master, slave, lord, serf, employer, employee. Mm -hmm. And just like the serfs and just like the slaves, human beings have wanted to do better. And better sooner or later means getting rid of, going beyond the split between a dominant minority and a subservient majority. And that's the root of, of Marxism, that's the root of socialism and communism. The reason Marxism even exists is that after capitalism had been around for a good century or two, uh, along came this guy, Karl Marx, uh, a German by birth, although he lived most of his life and wrote most of his work sitting in English-speaking London. Well, he came along and he pulled together 
all the yearnings, all the experiments, and came up with what he understood was a general critical analysis of capitalism. And the purpose of it was to let people know how this system works so that you can be more effective in getting beyond it, which he, as a critic of capitalism, uh, believed was possible. And that book became, if you like, the Bible, because it was a coming together, like the actual Bible was too, of many people over a period of time condensed into some. Marx didn't even write the whole Bible, uh, excuse me, the whole uh, of his work, uh, like Das Kapital. If you know anything about it, he wrote the first volume. It's a three-volume work. His buddy Engels wrote a, another one, and a, 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 a colleague of Marx and Engels named Karl Kautsky, another German, wrote the other one. So it's a collaborative project, and it was designed to be, if you like, the manual. Here's how capitalism works. Here's why it has these problems. Here's why we want to get beyond it. And here's how we ought to begin at least to go about it. But then Marx dies. About 150 years ago, he dies. And what's left are his ideas written down. And then the people around the world who, like him, yearned to do better, to go beyond capitalism, discovered that this man had figured a lot of things out. Or if he was part of a group, well, then the group had done a really good job summarizing, analyzing, this was powerful stuff. How do we know that? Well, Marxism starts with Karl Marx sitting in London, writing letters to people. I mean, it literally starts with, I don't know, 20 people. Right. 150 years later, right now, as I'm talking to you, every country on Earth has Marxist organizations, Marxist magazines, Marxist labor unions, Marxist, I mean, fill in the blank. It is unbelievable. I mean, you the only things in the history of the human race that spread this fast were things like Christianity, Islam, the great movements of, of ways of thinking, and they took longer. Marxism became global in the shortest imaginable a period of time. That gives you a hint that people in very different cultures, very different histories, uh, coming from very different backgrounds, all found that this analysis of what capitalism is, the system we live in, and how to go beyond it, or at least how to understand it well enough to make efforts to go beyond it, is invaluable. So that ought to make you a little leery of dismissing it. Uh, it makes about as much sense as dismissing Islam or dismissing Christianity. Mm -hmm. I mean, it really is strange. Anyway, last point. Starting at the end of the 19th century, really literally around the time that Marx dies, there begin to be enough followers, enough people who've read this stuff, that they begin to make experiments in how to take the analysis Marx writes and actually change society. Now, Marx never wrote a blueprint. Marx didn't believe in looking into the future. He thought that was a joke. Nobody can tell the future. And he said, I can't either. So I'm not going to speculate on how it's going to work. I am going to say, here are the problems you're going to have to solve to make it get better. But how exactly are you going to do it and when and where? I mean, that's the future. Who knows? Mm -hmm. So you have to keep separate the analytics of Marx which are over here, written down, accessible to everybody, on the internet, everywhere. And then you have to begin to look at the experiments. Why? Because that answers your question. The first experiment, really, literally the first, has no particular name. It happened in 1871. Marx was not dead yet. He died in 1883. 
1871, a dozen years earlier, and I don't have the time to go into it, the city of Paris erupts in a revolution. The old regime, the old government is thrown out, and the working class of Paris takes over. It, it runs that big city in France as a worker cooperative enterprise. Is that the uh, Paris Commune? Is that exactly. It's called the Paris Commune. There's a rich literature uh, by all kinds of people, people who love it, people who hate it, and those in between. Anyone interested can go learn about it. It didn't last but a few months. So it's a vet, but it was a very powerful event because it gave people the idea that Marx's thinking could be operationalized. In other words, it wasn't just a theory, it could become a framework to do something practical. Okay, but it didn't last long. It was repressed by the French army. Very ugly story, but you know, people can find it out. And from 1871 to 1917, that's almost half a century, there were no more major experiments. What did happen was that political parties developed that picked up Marxism. By far the most famous and the strongest were in Germany, not so surprising, and in Austria, which is another country, but it is controlled by the German language, that they share that language. A party began in Germany called the SPD, the Socialist Party of the German word for Germany, which is Deutschland, so SPD. By the way, that party, which officially adopted Marx and Marxism as its framework, wanted to go beyond German capitalism. The current chancellor in Germany, that's the highest political official, a man named Schultz. What of Schultz, yeah. Yeah, he's a member of that same party. It, it has changed over the years, heaven knows. But here's a little touch of history. He's still a member of the SPD uh, the party that comes out of it. Austria has the same thing. Uh, and then it spreads. France, England, the United States. These people called themselves, get ready now, socialists. That And, and then what they meant by that was... They want to go beyond capitalism. They are anti-capitalist. They want to go beyond capitalism to a new and better society, which they called socialism. Again, it's another conversation why they chose that name. Okay. They became very powerful. By the end of the 19th century, after being in existence only 30 years, the SPD was the number two political party in Germany. At the end of World War I, which Germany lost, the German government, the losing government of that war, collapsed. And the German army had no government anymore. And when they surrendered to the allies, that would be Britain, France, and the US, when they surrendered, the Germans who stepped forward to be the new government were members of the Socialist Party. So 1917, 18 was the first time socialists got into political power. The biggest event, however, wasn't Germany. The biggest event was Russia. Mm -hmm. In Russia, a movement of people inspired by Marx led by people who became famous because their revolution succeeded. These are names like Lenin, Trotsky, Stalin, and others. They made a revolution in 1917 in Russia at the end of the same World War I. They succeeded, they overthrew the Russian government, they took power. But here is now a problem. As a result of the Russian Revolution, and by the way, 
Lenin, Stalin, and Trotsky called themselves socialists, like everybody else who was in this tradition. But they wanted to make an experiment different from the one that the socialists in Germany and other parts of Europe wanted. In other words, socialism had become so big that it had internal disagreements about how to go about. And here, in a nutshell, is the disagreement. Mm -hmm. The socialists, by and large, believed, had come to believe, that the way to make society better was to give an enormously more important role to the government, that the government would regulate private enterprise, you know, uh, offices, factories, and stores, that the government would control them. And the idea was, let's harness the productivity of private enterprise to the general welfare by having the government step in and basically make the industries do things they wouldn't have done for their own private profit, but they now have to do because the government comes in and tells them. Setting up, of course, a tension between private capitalists who didn't want to be controlled by the government and the working class who look to the socialists to at least make their lives in capitalism better. And so that's what the socialists did. They didn't want to have an all-out war with the private capitalists, so they let them be. They simply said, we're going to let you be. We're going to stay with capitalism, even though we're socialists, but we're going to have capitalism, and this was the phrase they like to use, with a human face. And here's what it means. Wages can't go below a certain amount. Capitalists have to pay a lot of taxes to provide basic public services to everybody, like schooling, like pensions, like all the things that make life an, uh, acceptable, decent. So we're not all living in the kind of capitalism described by Charles Dickens in his novels about London. The, the Russian socialists said, no, 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 no. We're not making any compromise with the capitalists, because what that means is you're leaving in place independent decision makers who have the power, because they run the enterprises, and they have the money, because they collect the profits into their hands, and they will be a stronger force shaping society than anything you in the government will be able to do. And in the end, they'll work on their own employees to make them feel badly about socialism and you'll become weaker over time. So we're not doing it that way. Here in Russia, here's what we're gonna do. We're not gonna allow private capitalism to exist. The government is not only gonna control and regulate, here we go now, the government is gonna take over, own and operate enterprises, industry. And Russia did that, Soviet Russia did that. And so they decided to call themselves something different to signal how important they thought, they thought their change was and so that the world of people who are anti-capitalist begins to understand it has options, it has multiple way. But these are all experiments. The Soviet Union was an experiment. Cuba is an experiment, North Korea, North Vietnam, China. China yeah. These are the early efforts to take a critique of capitalism and use it to begin to figure out what a new and different system would be. And it, it ought to be judged in that way. In other words, it is, it is really historically ignorant not to judge it as an early experiment. It's the thing you, you do you make mistakes. That's why we have things called trial and error. You do things and you learn from them. This worked, we should do more of that. This didn't work, we should do less of that. Capitalism did not come out of feudalism in Europe, all finished. It came out in lots of experiments in this village, in this city, in this town. 
you know, Italy happened much earlier than other parts of Europe because they were in touch with the Arab communities of the, of the Middle East. And so they were ahead in those days. The Chinese were ahead. Then the Europeans surged ahead. But experiments are what finally lead to having a sense, okay, we've come up with what works. And we live at a time when this has happened. The Soviet experiment, the, the Paris Commune lasted a few months. The Soviet experiment lasted 70 years. That's not so bad, but it also fell apart. And one of the lessons learned has been the lesson by the, the next great experiment, which is that of the People's Republic of China. And that experiment says, don't kill your capitalist enterprises, but don't get rid of your public ones either. If you have a strong, powerful, communist, socialist, political power in the government, you can blend the two. You can coordinate between them. You get the best of both of them to get rid of the worst of both of them, and you can do better. And so that leads me to tell everybody, because it's very important, that over the last 30 years, we in effect have had a test. The Soviet Union is gone, but we can test how well did the particular way China, which by the way, refers to his, its system in these words. In China, they have socialism with Chinese characteristics. That's their words. But you know, pretty good, because what they've done has achieved the following over the last generation, 25, 30 years. The growth of the Chinese economy, uh, which they, as I say, they call a socialist economy, the growth of the economy has been growing at a rate for 25 years or more, three times faster than the United States, year in and year out. If economic growth is your priority, then the contest between the United States and China is over. China won and the U.S. lost. I'm not saying this is good or bad. I don't want people to jump on me. I'm just telling you what's been going on. It's up to you to decide what you feel about. Mm -hmm. Let me give you another example. Over the last 25 years, the average real wage of a Chinese worker that's the amount of money he or she gets in their pay envelope adjusted for the prices they have to pay. The real wage in China has quadrupled. It's four times today what it was, which is a clue to why the Chinese people like their government. By comparison, the real wage in the United States is barely 10 or 11% more today than it was 30 to 40 years ago. Their wages went up four times, ours went up 10%. Wow. Again, no contest. One more. The biggest problem in the United States today, most people would agree, is inflation. Yes, I was going to actually uh, segue into I'm that. I'm going to talk about that. The inflation rate officially in this country at this point is somewhere between eight and a half and nine percent, more or less. The inflation in China today and last year and the year before, get ready, is two percent. When the president of the United States says, well, inflation, that's a global problem, uh, it isn't. It isn't. That's you can call Mr. Biden any name in the book. But an honest reflection, no. In Japan, by the way, not a socialist country at all, the inflation is 3%. This country's economy is out of control, which is why we have those. But socialists and communists are what they are. Those were the names that developed out of these early experiments. And, and one last point. Many, many socialists, and this has been true for decades do not like do not align themselves either with the traditional socialism or with the traditional communism or with the chinese let's call it hybrid 
They don't. They think socialism means still other things. Either instead of what the conventional socialists and communists want, or in addition. And by far the most important of these emerging kinds of socialism is the one that says the missing element in both traditional socialism with the government coming in and regulating and controlling what are still private capitalist enterprises. What's wrong with that is the same thing that was wrong with the Soviet experiment of all state-owned and operated enterprises. And that was they never changed the organization of production inside the enterprise, inside the factory, inside the office, inside the store. If socialism means anything, these socialists say, it means the democratization of the enterprise, yeah. making the enterprise something where we are all of us, one person, one vote, no small group telling a lot, no employer dictating to employees, no master, no slave, no lord, no serf. And this is a whole new way of, uh, and the next experiments you see, that's what you're gonna be seeing. In fact, you already see them because around the world we have something called worker co-ops and that's what they're doing. We, we need to go to a, a quick break, Rick. And I thought it'd be a, an, a, a that's a great segue because that's actually leading into my next question, which I think is a very interesting subject. So we're going to go to a quick break. Welcome back to the show. I've got uh, Professor Richard Wolf here with me uh, on the long way around. And if you're just tuning in, uh, welcome to the show. Rich, uh, that was a fantastic explanation. And I often say to people, the difference between communism and socialism is communism is more of a systemic organizational term, whereas socialism is, and I may be paraphrasing you, is simply the ability to criticize the system to make it better. Yeah. Um, but my my and I actually was watching your uh, um, democracy at work talk today. I'm very fascinated about this idea of the alliance between labor unions and worker uh, co-ops, which is what we were just kind of uh, hinting at before we took the break. Yeah, um, it's a wonderful subject, you know, and it's it's strange here to answer this question here in the United States because in Western Europe, for example. In many of the countries there, there has been and there is now an ongoing alliance uh, between labor movements and labor unions on the one hand and worker co-ops. Just like the worker co-op is a much more developed aspect of European economies, not all of them, but of many of them, than here in the United States. Uh, they're more familiar with them. I mean, just to give you an example if you're not familiar. Uh, the province of Emilia Romagna in Italy. It's a big province in the middle of Italy. Uh, they've had about 40%, 4-0, 40% of their economy is worker co-ops. And it's been like that for many decades. Um, efforts to reduce it have failed. Uh, efforts to somehow squeeze it out of existence have also failed. They're very proud. They believe the uh, well-being, the wealth of that part of Italy is in no small part due to the enormous importance and power of worker co-ops. I'll give you another example, the, perhaps the most famous, is in Spain. In a small city in the north of Spain, um, there is something called the Mondragon Cooperative Corporation. It's actually a holding company that's a family of about somewhere between 150 and 200 co-ops. Uh, it began 56, or no, it began in 1956, so a long time ago, when a Catholic priest, Spain is a Catholic country, when a Catholic priest made a joke to his few parishioners, it's a very poor part of Spain, very agricultural, mountainous in the north, um, he said, if we wait for jobs in our town, if we wait for employers to come in here and give us jobs, we will all die of old age 
before that ever happens. So how about we become our own employer? We set up a worker co-op where all of us run it and work in it at the same time. It's a self-governing enterprise. And he was a Roman Catholic priest, so all of this took place in a kind of um, complicated relationship within the protection of the Roman Catholic Church, which is pretty much the official church uh, of Spain. It's the overwhelmingly uh, biggest of all religions in that country. Um, Okay, so fast forward to today. Started, by the way, with this priest and six workers. Today, it is the seventh largest corporation in all of Spain. It has over 100,000 workers under its corporate umbrella. Um, in Not in all, but in many of them, they run it like a democratic community. What does that mean? Well, to give you an idea, all the basic decisions are made by majority vote of the workers in the enterprise. They meet, they discuss, they debate, and then they hold the vote. And the majority wins. And by the majority, I mean the majority that decides what the enterprise is going to produce, what technology it's going to use, uh, where the p- production is going to happen, and here comes a big one. What's going to be done with the revenue that they collect when they sell whatever the output is. Uh, These are all now democratic decisions. Contrast that with capitalism. There is no such, I've been an employee all my life. None of my employers ever asked me to participate in making any of those decisions. I was an employee, I was to do what, how, where, when the work had to be done. And when the revenue came in, I didn't see it. I didn't participate. I was told, here's your wage. Go home, get a pizza, a beer, and come back tomorrow morning, and we'll tell you what to do then, too. And be grateful for it. <laughs> yes, and be grateful that we don't fire you. Right. That's, That's right. Right. In, in, in Mondragon, you can't be. There is, the, the workers hire the supervisors, not the other way around. Twice a year, the workers evaluate the supervisors. Mm. If they believe the supervisors are doing a good job, they continue them. If they don't, they fire them. Supervisors cannot fire workers. Only workers can fire other workers. They have to have a discussion, a debate. The worker has to have a chance to explain what he or she did or didn't do. It's a, it's Imagine an enterprise that the workers ran in the way that they wanted to. Spain has this. European countries all over the place have it. Okay, here's now the punchline for the United States. Unions have a function. Their job is to make the wages we get as workers and the working conditions we live with as workers better than they would be if the union wasn't there. That's when unions are formed. These days, you know, every other Starbucks barista, every other Amazon warehouse uh, worker is thinking about unions. It's all over the place. Yes. I just read this morning, Home Depot is facing its first unionization drive for an entire store. Okay, it's every, why? Because those workers feel that they're not treated well. They're not paid enough. They are made to work crazy hours. They're not told from one week to the next which hours they have to show in. And if they displease the supervisor, they're bounced out of there no matter what the cost to them, their family, the community, et cetera, et cetera. And they've had it with that. Okay, if unions form for this reason, here's what they've discovered. Often the employer doesn't care whether you have a union or not. He refuses to bargain with you. He refuses to meet whatever demands. He refuses to make a compromise. He just refuses. What do workers do then? They got a union, they are there, but they can't budge. Well, they have something, a weapon in that case. They often don't want to use the weapon, but it's good to have it 
because you can get your employer to sit down with you by threatening this weapon, uh, and it's called a strike. We all know what it is. It's when the workers say, okay, if you won't meet us halfway, if we can't work something out here, we're going to do the only thing left to us, which is to withdraw our labor. And that will be an important lesson to you, Mr. Employer. You know what the lesson is? You can have all the best machines in the world. And you can have all the best designs. And you can have all the sharpest executives. But if you don't have the workers, you've got nothing. Well, no profit, nothing happens. Well, but now, let me just make the... Sorry, keep go going, ahead. Right? Pardon me. The, the worker co-op is like the strike. The worker co-op gives the labor movement another weapon. Here's how it goes. Dear Mr. Employer, please, you know, give us a wage increase or give us better hours or whatever it is. If you don't, we may strike. If the strike doesn't work, we have something else. Here it is, dear Mr. Employer. We are going to buy this business out from underneath you. You're not going to be the owner, the operator. We are. We are going to collectively buy the enterprise and convert it from a top-down capitalist enterprise that you had into a democratically run worker co-op that we're going to establish. So if you don't want that to happen, well, then we suggest you work out a deal with us. It becomes an, an alliance between unions and co-ops. And if a co-op does develop somewhere, it will give, for example, benefits to its ally, the union. If the union goes on strike, the co-op will give union members a discount during the strike to help them get through it. If there's a political party that reflects the needs and desires of union members and worker co-ops, both of them will fund that party. Both of them will recruit for that party. And that party will push to get laws and regulations that make it easier to form a union, that make it easier to form a work. In other words, they, they help each other. This becomes the basis for a new left political movement in America that can change everything. So that's why you'll, you'll pick up these days an excitement in the ranks of labor and in the ranks of worker co-ops, and we have hundreds of these in the country right now, about possibilities of working closely together. You know, I, I was thinking about something that um, the author Chris Hedges has often talked about, you know, in his responses to the concept of a third party, you know, a viable third party in, in the United States, which is often dismissed as either completely, you know, pie in the sky impossible or, oh, the system's so, you know, invested in this two party political duopoly, I call it, that that's just not going to be possible because there's just not enough money to to support candidates, but what Chris has often said is that the only viable route towards a third party is through the organization of labor. Would yeah. you would you agree with that statement? Absolutely. And and one of the reasons I just said what I said about alliances between labor unions and labor movement on the one hand and and kind of pleading that they see the worker co op as the extension. I mean the basic argument to the American worker is Every time you negotiate with an employer, even if you struggle hard, even if you win a wage increase, uh, better job conditions, you know that the employer has an incentive from the minute you win that to take it away from you, to maneuver around, to fire the union leaders so he gets people that have less courage, or maybe to persuade workers by threatening them to go against the union, to do, in other words, the union has to learn, and every union has learned it, that in the capitalist system, even when you win something, you're never able to relax. You're never able to turn around. 
the, the capitalist wants more profit. That's what he's in business for. And everything the union gets is the kind of obstacle for him, and he's going to go to work to remove the obstacle. Imagine the difference if the people you were negotiating with were yourselves. You were the people who owned the, the enterprise. That would be a very different conversation. You wouldn't have an adversary, mm -hmm. an antagonist, who's always looking to undo whatever it is you were able to do, to take advantage of every weakness, to, to, go, to go to the government and get laws passed that tilt the playing field against labor and for capital. If you had a, a different economic system, you would be the owners and operators of the enterprise. And you would it would be absurd for you to sit on one side of the table, get something, then run around, sit on the other side of the table, and work to get rid of it. Nobody's that stupid. And what you would get instead is a negotiated, how do we manage the enterprise but give ourselves the decent lives we all want? It, it, it's almost a natural progression that there ought to be that kind of an alliance. And I also think this is the moment. What you're seeing, this nationwide interest in unionization, the nationwide interest in strikes, the nationwide phenomena of what is called these days quiet quitting, or that used to be called quit rates, the statistic the government of all the people who walk away from a job, Workers in America used to be afraid to walk away from a job. You never knew, is there going to be another one? And if there is, why would you assume it's going to be better than the one you're walking away from? So people, but they've had it now. Something happened during the pandemic and the crash. Uh, being told one day that you're the essential worker and we all love you, and the next day, but we're cutting your benefits, that's too much. You've provoked... So this is the moment. This is the moment when young workers particularly, but everybody is questioning, is doubting. And it's also a time, to be blunt, when the system is, is shaking. L let me put it this way, because the way of looking at it that people don't often have. For the last 30 years, the gap between rich and poor in this country has gotten much wider. Every statistician I know, left winger, right winger in the middle, acknowledges that. They may, ha they may dispute these numbers or those, but the, the growth is obvious. We didn't have uh, Jeffrey Be Bezos's and Elon Musk's and all of that uh, 75 years ago. You know, the average CEO got 30 or 40 times what the average worker did back in the 1960s. He gets 300 to 400 times today. I mean, it's everywhere. It's obvious. Um, it seems to me that the working class knows this in its guts, even if it can't say it in so many uh, polished words. So we've had this long period in which the American dream is slipping out of the reach of more and more people. Everybody talks about the vanishing middle class, the hundred ways of saying this. Okay, here comes now the punchline. In 2020, we had a crash of the capitalist American, the American capitalist system. We had one. The, the pandemic hit in February. The crash began in January. You can call it the COVID-19 crash, but we have crashes of capitalism on average every four to seven years. We had the first one in this century in the year 2000. We had the second one in this century in the year 2008. And we had the third one in the year 2020. That's it, every seven years, right on schedule. And it was the second worst in American history. In, in the two years, 2020 and 2021, more than half of the American working class, that's more than 80 million job holders, lost their job. Some for only a few weeks, some for the whole time, most of them somewhere in between. That is a staggering loss. 
If you're out of work for several weeks, if you had any savings, they're gone. If you've never leaned on family and friends, now you're going to do it. Remember, most Americans carry a lot of debt. You got to keep the debt paid off. So what did you do? You, you didn't pay your rent. But that's been accumulating as a kind of a hatchet over your head when you have to finally pay it. You, you put the American working class through the ringer. Then the pandemic came, and this country, with one of the biggest and most developed medical care systems in the world, one of the richest countries in the world, did about the worst in the world in terms of coping with over a million of our fellow citizens dead and and tens of millions of families with long COVID people who can't go back to work, uh, with medical bills they can't in a million years pay, with agony wondering what, what disease is going to hit them when in the next few years. I mean, it's it. And then you hit them with an inflation. Let me be clear to everyone. The inflation now, eight and a half, nine percent for prices. The rise in wages average in this country, five percent. So even if you're among the workers who gets a five percent increase this year over last, you'll still be able to afford much less in the way of goods and services with your raise because of the inflation. And then the culmination. The, this is the week that the Federal Reserve jacked up the interest rates again, meaning that it's more expensive to buy a home, more expensive to buy a car, more expensive to carry any balance on your credit card, more expensive to borrow to help your child get a college education. You've whacked the working class with a crash, with the pandemic, with the inflation, and now with the interest. You know something? You can't do that to a working class without seeing it become, and I use this word carefully, the working class becomes crazy. And the greatest example is Germany. I was you know, Germany going to ask you. Germany was the great, yeah, Germany was the great competitor of the United States to replace the British Empire in the 19th century. By early in the, 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 the 20th century, by 1914, when the war starts, Britain is on the way down as an empire, and the contestants for who's going to replace them, the United States, the ultimate winner, who did, and Germany. And they fight a world war, all of them. Germany loses. The German people were not prepared. The German people thought they could and would never lose. In that they're like the American people. And the Germans didn't know how to cope. They lost World War I. Within the three or four years, the trauma of a lost war produced the greatest inflation in modern history. In the years 1923, roughly in 1923, the German mark, that was the name the Deutsche Mark at that time of their currency went from four to a dollar to six trillion to a dollar. Prices were doubling every couple of hours, and this went on for months. People got paid in bags of money, ran home, handed it off to another family member who ran to the store to spend that money, because if you waited until the evening, all that money would get you a, a, an eighth of a pound of butter because the prices had gone crazy. All the savings of the German people, very, very frugal, save much more, by the way, than Americans do, wiped out. Those savings became nothing because the prices went up so fast that all that you'd collected in your shoebox wouldn't get you a pair of shoelaces. And that's in 23. Then in 1929, you hit them with the Great Depression. It was too much. Lose a war, collapse the system, lose your savings. Everybody's desperately poor. And then the Depression takes away your job. And you turn to a little guy with a funny mustache named Adolf Hitler who promises you he will make Germany great again, should sound familiar, to an, a population of, of working people who said, we're desperate. 
this guy looks crazy. He is weird. But, you know, the establishment got us into this mess, offers us nothing to come out of it. The way the Bush family or uh, Mr. Biden offer nothing to fundamentally deal with the problems of this society. And therefore, you're going to have people looking at the Trumps and at the uh, DeSantis's and God knows who else uh, gets thrown up because they are desperate and you are making them desperate. And yet you have to be denying that this is a system that is driving people to a point in which their normal decencies, you know, Americans are decent people. They're good at helping. But we're seeing a population that turns on the poorest of the poor immigrants from Central America and demonizes them. You know, what? What are you doing? What's that What's that Christian stuff on Sunday that you hear? Where is it in the rest of your life? And you know, when you say that one-on-one, -on -one, they look shamefaced. They know what you're saying, but they're desperate. Mm -hmm. you put people in desperate positions, they do desperate things. Well, you know, uh, I'm going to paraphrase, paraphrase the great Mark Twain. I think he once quipped, "History doesn't rhyme. Uh, history does rarely repeats, but it often rhymes." I think that was the paraphrase. <laughs> anyway, my point being is that you know there are certain um, parallels to the Weimar era in Germany, yeah. as you've referred to, and of course the rise of a strong man, woman, or whatever, uh, sort of, oh, you know, they've got, they're not part of the system. We're going to look to that individual to solve our problems. And it's all based on a kind of a fantasy, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I do hope that uh, the um, the lessons of what you're saying resonate with the American people because the option is, is pretty dark, you know, this sort of populist um, idea. We're going to go to another quick break. Uh, and we'll be right back with Professor Richard Wolf. Please stay tuned. From our studio in Midtown, this is Radio Kingston, WKNY, AM 1490, FM 1079, Kingston, New York. Hi, I'm Adrienne of Bartley. Hola, mi nombre es Neri, aquí de Broadway Bubble. Hi, I'm Jill from the Broadway Bubble at 718 Broadway. We have a super attentive staff and we speak English, Spanish, and Quiche. Tenemos un personal muy atento y hablamos inglés, español, y Quiche. We've renovated and have a really nice workspace, kids space, snack table, free soap, free dryer on Wednesday, and we even have a drop-off service. Espacio para niños, mesa aperitivos, jabón gratis, secadores gratis, los miércoles, e incluso tenemos un servicio de entrega. That's the Broadway Bubble at 718 Broadway. We're open seven days a week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Estamos abiertos los siete días de la semana de 8 a 8 de la tarde. Radio Kingston. Many voices. Many voices. Muchas voces. One community. Hi, I'm Michael Berg from Family of Woodstock. We're here on Radio Kingston with Family Time, Tuesdays at 6 p.m. during Jimmy Buff Loves You. It's a half-hour show where you can expect to learn a lot about the programs that Family runs, the services we provide to the community, and how we can help you and the people you love. We'll talk about child care, restorative justice, reentry, domestic violence, emergency services, and food insecurity, and lots more. That's Family Time, Tuesday at 6 p.m. here on Radio Kingston, AM 1490, FM 1079, and anytime at RadioKingston.org. And if you're just joining me, uh, we're going into the second hour of The Long Way Around. I'm your host, Malcolm Byrne, here at Radio Kingston. And uh, you've been listening, if you've been listening, we are uh, listening to uh, an interview I did earlier this week with Professor Richard Wolff, as Richard explains the basics of Marxism, communism, socialism, and how it's uh, highly relevant and 
probably the way of the future for certainly uh, the rest of the world, but uh, I think very likely this country is inevitably going to come around to it too, and he's going to explain why in this next half of the interview. So here we go. Stay tuned. We're back on the radio with Professor Richard Wolf, and we're just talking about the musical playlist. Uh, there's some great material on there, and I've, I've, uh, we've listened to the, the Marseillais. Um, at a certain point, we'll listen, we'll listen to the Internationale, uh, the yeah. Soviet version of that. And I've also dug up a, a beautiful, I don't know if you're familiar with the rendition, uh, you would suggest to Joe Hill, uh, the Woody Guthrie version, but I found a beautiful version by Paul Robeson. And yes, that would be very great. Oh, you know, so, fine. Yeah. So, in fact, let's listen to that right now. This is Paul Robeson with Joe Hill. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night Alive as you and me Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead I never died, says he I never died, says he In Salt Lake City, Joe, says I Him standing by my bed They framed you on a murder charge Says Joe, but I did Says Joe Says, killed you, Joe. They shot you, Joe, says I. Takes more than guns to kill a man, says Joe. I didn't die, says Joe. I didn't die. And standing there as big as life and smiling with his eyes. Says Joe, what they can never kill Went on to organize Went on to organize From San Diego up to Maine In every mine and mill Where workers strike and organize It's there you find your hill it's there you find your hill. I dreamed I saw Joe Hill last night, alive as you and me. Says I, but Joe, you're ten years dead. I never died, says he. That was um, the um, the inimitable Paul Robeson, uh, very strong advocate for the workers. Of course, uh, I you, saw you recently. You were just on uh, George Galloway's show the other day. He was a guest on this show a couple of months ago. What a wonderful <laughs> guy he is! Uh, yes. But uh, I think maybe for this last little bit of time that we've got you, I would love to get your take on. I I have this kind of. I don't mean to sound like a conspiracy theorist, but it seems to me that the only economic solution that the West has is perpetual war. Um, how can you explain to the average American worker who is, as you pointed out, struggling under all of these burdens of debt uh, and so forth, uh, coming out of COVID, which apparently is officially ended according to our president, how can you possibly justify 50 odd billion dollars and counting of investment into Ukraine? And I heard you talk about this on George's show where you said, look, if we just gave 
Ukraine hundred billion dollars a year. Please, please uh, elaborate on that concept. Yeah, I mean, this has to do with 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 so many issues that you know. I, I kind of I hardly know where uh, to start. It's pretty huge. I mean, yeah. Uh, I'm going to blame, I guess that's the word to you, I'm going to blame the Puritan origins of the United States. The need to see the world in terms really starkly of the good guys and the bad guys. And the good guys have to be just squeaky clean, good, 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 to the nth degree. And likewise, the bad ones have to be bad, 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 to likewise the nth degree. Like a Marvel we, comic or something like that. Yeah, it's just, it's, it's just awful. I remember I was driving in my car back at, in the war in Iraq, and as the build up to the war in Iraq, uh, and, and by the way, let's remember, the United States invaded Iraq. Illegally, the United States illegally. invaded in Afghanistan. The United States invaded Vietnam. Those countries didn't invade us. We invaded them. Uh, keep that in mind when you see the outrage that Russia invaded Ukraine. By the way, I'm against Russia doing that. I don't want countries to be doing that. But you cannot be the United States and a straight face be talking about the awfulness of a big country invading a little one. Well, there's no moral. There's no moral standing to be had. How, how can you point the finger when you've, for the last twenty years, you've been engaging in countless illegal <laughs> wars yeah. of, all around yeah, no, the world? No, it, 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 but yet we do it. We make Mr. Putin the evilest, awfulest, terriblest person on earth. The story I was about to tell when I was driving my car at the Iraq. I heard. I believe it was someone working for the New York Times, equate Saddam Hussein with Hitler. You know, what is this? What do you, you know, the absurdity of it, what are you doing? It, it's, it's bad. If you read most of the American history, not now, we're getting smarter about these things now, but the, the genocide committed by Europeans against the indigenous people of the United States was handled for many, many decades by the victory of decency over savagery. They were set. I mean, you killed when men, women and children on a massive scale. Nothing comparable happened to you. Nothing remotely comparable because you had all the guns and they didn't and all the rest. But this is a country that can't come to terms, and it has done it over and over again. Every war ends in a negotiation. Even when there's a surrender of one side against the other, that has to be worked out because there are a lot of complexities. And so what are we doing? Why are you demonizing? What's the point? And the only answer I can come up with is that's what Americans expect. If you don't demonize, they won't think there's enough of a of an issue here for them to get excited about. And as it is, most Americans don't get excited about Ukraine. I've done the experiment myself. I've asked my students, here's a map of Europe. Where's Ukraine? They have no idea. And these are students. These are smart young men and women. And they're well-schooled. But they don't. They, they have no reason to. There is nothing, nothing going on there. So okay, so what have we got? The real issue here, and pardon me for talking bluntly, but the real issue here is the contest in this world right now between the two major economic powers. One of them is the United States, and the other one is the People's Republic of China. Russia is a ally of Mr. Uh, Xi Jinping in China. Um, it turns out that the Chinese and the Russians together have lots and lots of allies around the world. That's why the UN vote on Ukraine 
was the way it was. That's why Russia survives to this moment, because they can sell oil and gas all over the place to people who are perfectly happy to pay for it and who will not return the telephone calls from Mr. Zelensky. And I'm not arguing whether that's good or bad, but let's be honest with one another. Otherwise, what's the conversation about here? We're exchanging fantasies. I don't want to do that. I don't even think you want to do that. You know, you, the average public. So let's be honest about what's going on. Russia invades Ukraine. That's a military conflict been going on for quite some years in that eastern area of Ukraine. Yeah, at least. So now close. this is an escalation, no question. Russians did that, open, very open to debate whether they could have and should have and all that. I get that. I don't like that they did it. I disagree with it and all that. that but that's not my point here. My point here is what did the United States and Europe do? They acted like they can crush this event. They don't have to talk to anybody. They don't have to negotiate with anybody. They are going to punish the bad people. And so we get an endless litany. How bad Mr. Putin is. How evil the Russians are. How murderous they are. On and on. Without let up without let up, despite loads of evidence pointing in different and more complicated directions. Okay, the United States and Western Europe make the commitment, we're going to fight the Russians where we have the advantage. We don't have the advantage of putting troops on the ground, and the honest reason is, I don't think it would work. I don't think Mr. Uh, our president could get the American people to support a ground war in Europe against Russia. And I don't think he wants to make the effort. Who We'll see. I could be wrong, we'll see. So he can't fight them militarily. It's too dangerous anyway. The Russians have nuclear weapons, and so do the Chinese. So we're going to respond with economic warfare. Okay, now let's all be clear. I'm gonna be an economist for a minute and give you a fact that you need to have in your head when you think about this, Russia has an annual GDP. That's the output of goods and services uh, of their country in a year. That's, a, that's a, a statistic we use in economics to give you a sense of the size of an economy. So Russia is a one and a half trillion dollar economic unit. The United States, which is waging economic war on Russia has a GDP of $21 trillion. The European allies working with the United States, if you put them together, Germany, France, England, Italy, and so on, that's probably another nine or 10. So we got $30 trillion worth of economic system on one side, and one and a half trillion in money on the other. That's called a struggle between David and Goliath. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna wage economic war, here is a wager in which the Russians cannot possibly compete. They can protect themselves, which by the way, they have done better than anyone foresaw, anyone. Uh, and that's because of their link with China, and that's particularly because of the behavior of India and many, many other small countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Although once the results of the election in Italy this week are in, my expectation is Russia's going to have a new ally in the new Italian government. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. Okay. Of course, the Russians don't want to be defeated. And let's remember, over the last several centuries, there have been three efforts to defeat the Russians in war. Napoleon, World War I, and Adolf Hitler. And they beat 
every one of them, you ought to think long and hard about what you're doing if you want to go up against Russia militarily. You better know what you're getting into. You better have the resources. You better be ready to play endless games. And, and you have to reckon with that for the Russians, being on the wrong side of a economic warfare between 30 trillion on one side and your little trillion and a half, you're gonna pull out every, you've got nothing to lose anymore. You're already a miracle in what you've achieved. Let's all be clear. Since the war began, the Russians have defeated the Ukrainians and taken over an enormous amount of their territory. Well, also the territory that they have contested contested uh, is kind of the Eastern European equivalent of the Ruhr Valley. You know, it's the industrial heartland of the country. So right. in many, many ways, Ukraine is, is heading towards the inevitable, which is a failed state. What I'm curious about is, and George, good old George, he, he puts it in, a, in, a, in, a, in his inimitable, inimitable Scottish brogue. He says, yeah. Europe has lifted a giant rock and now it's landed on its own foot. Yeah. It seems that what Europe and to some degree America has committed sort of almost economic suicide over this situation in, with the sanctions. It's completely backfired. And, and I'm quoting you when, when I say that. Yeah. I mean, the joke in Europe, among the people I talk to, is that the United States is committed to fighting Russia in Ukraine to the last Ukrainian. That's a bitter joke. And it's accompanied by an even more bitter joke, which is not only to the last Ukrainian, but to the last European, mm -hmm. that our economic systems, our political systems, you know, the establishment political parties, and they are the only ones that lined up beside the United States. They're in ever deeper trouble. They are on the edge of losing uh, in France. Well, there was They're just on a the edge of shake up losing. In, in Sweden. In Sweden, in Italy. Greece. Uh, the British are, are living out a, a fa I mean, it's unspeakable. You, Britain is arguably in the worst shape of any major European country. It's been getting working in that direction for 15 years. It faked its way through the Brexit by telling itself that if it only got free of Europe, well, then it'll solve all its problems, which makes exactly the same sense as if we had followed Mr. Trump into getting rid of immigrants and thinking that would solve all America's problems. And here are the British desperate. And what do they do? I mean, talk about denial. They just treated the world to an, a, a display of royalty with diamond-studded crowns on a coffin with their queen uh, recently departed. They're spending wild amount of money symbolically celebrating a monarch and an empire over which that monarch mo ruled, all of which are gone. And the conservatives who are in power picked as their new leader a woman who said the solution to our problems is to cut taxes on business. That's what they've been doing for 20 years. That's how they got here. Well, she's and also said quite openly in a debate before she was officially became prime minister that uh, she was open to a limited nuclear war regarding... Russia and Ukraine, which is quite yeah. frightening to have a person like that in that position. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it's just, I mean the only comfort is, if that's any comfort, that as, as was said during the leadership of Tony Blair, the relationship between the United States and Britain is when the United States says jump, whoever the leader in Britain is, uh, asks the question, how high? Uh, it, it, that's, a, that's a sad comment, but I, I want to make everyone clear What's happening in Europe is also a polarization of left and right. Mr. Macron is the uh, establishment in France. He's dead. He's a, he's a walking dead person politically. 
you know, the right wing of, of Marina Le Pen is coming at him from one side. The unified left, Mr. Mélenchon, is very powerful, the second biggest vote getter in the last uh, parliamentary election. I mean, and neither of them has the attitude towards Ukraine you know, that the, that Mr. Macron has, and he doesn't share the German or the English. I mean, they are very worried. It has always been, ever since the Cold War after World War II, the anxiety of Europe has been that in the conflict between, in those days, the United States and the Soviet Union, they would be the sacrificial lamb. They would be where the missiles fell. They would be where the armies clashed. They will be what's what's blown away. And in many ways, that's what's happened, which is why Europe is in the terrible position. But it can't get out of that position if it hunkers down and follows the United States into this quagmire. This is, and with the decision now of, of Mr. Putin to call up the reserves in his military system, you know, where is this going to end? What kind, what logic Right. What is the interest of the United States in a war in the in Ukraine? I mean, really? Only if you have a fantasy that you could somehow so weaken this Russia that it would fall apart and that therefore their alliance with the Chinese would make them a little weaker. Well, that's Let me let me again the statistics. Working. Russia's GDP, one and a half trillion. U.S. GDP, uh, 21 trillion. Western Europe GDP, let's say nine trillion. People's Republic of China, GDP, 15 trillion. The Europeans better be very, very careful because they are the little guy in a struggle here which is between the United States and China. And eventually, since neither of them want the nuclear war, that would destroy the two of them most of all, as they destroy each other. If they're going to avoid that, they're going to have to do what the United States and Britain did. I keep telling people this story. The United States broke a, an unimportant little corner of an empire. It broke away. It said, we want to be independent. We don't, we hate colonialism. We hate you, George III, blah, 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 Tea Party, all of it. The British went to war to hold on to that colony. The, the War of Independence, 1775 and 6, is the American colony breaking away from the global colonial system. The British sent armies. They killed 70,000 people died in that war, Americans. A few years later in the War of 1812, they tried again. They killed 15,000. So you put it together, 85,000, at a time when the whole population of the country was a small fraction of what it is today. Then the British realized, we can't do that. We cannot force it. So we better work out a deal, which they did and that's the history ever since. That deal cost Britain a role reversal from being the top gun telling the U.S. what to do. It's exactly the reverse. That doesn't have to be the outcome. But the lesson in all of it is if the Chinese and the Americans want to avoid a war, which will be much more de destructive now than it ever could have been back in the 18th century, then they have to sit down and work this out. And at this point, the whole world believes that the Chinese would do it in an instant and that the refusal comes from the United States and Western Europe, which is how most people see why there's a war in Ukraine as well. Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great way to, to end things off, Rick. I definitely uh, would love to get you back on the show um, because things are always evolving and changing, and yep. and uh, you're a, a, a very strong, powerful, and logical voice. Uh, so we we all, on behalf of myself and and the group, <laughs> we'd like to thank you for being on well, the, on the it's show. My, yeah, it's my pleasure. I, I appreciate that there are programs like yours 
that have the courage to, to, to bring to bring these kinds of conversations into the public speech. This should be going on all over the country, all over the internet, all over uh, radio and television and everything, because literally the future of the world and of this country uh, depends on this. And instead of having the the kind of um, denial plus propaganda overkill, we ought to have the kinds of hard conversations where we can open up about our ambivalences, ambivalence about the United States, ambivalence about China. Neither one of these is the paragon of virtue. That Puritan notion of the good guys and bad guys is an obstacle to get coming up with workable solutions. Yes. God bless you, as they say where I come from. <laughs> <laughs> whatever you're God or whether you're an atheist, it doesn't matter. But uh, thanks very much and all the best to you. Good health. And, yeah, and, and, if, uh, and if you want to do it again, please get in touch. I'd be glad to do it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Take care. Goodbye. And that was an interview with uh, Professor Richard Wolf that I conducted earlier this week. And that was the uh, original broadcast And uh, I think he did an amazing job of explaining a lot of things that I think about but often can lack the ability to articulate. I was particularly fascinated by his discussions about um, labor and co-ops and and, uh, the the organization between those two forces. Uh, I think that that's probably the only viable um, political alternative to the stranglehold that the two parties that seem to rule the roost in this country, the Republicans and the Democrats, kind of the mono party, really, when you think about it, that they all vote for the same wars. Uh, so I <laughs> can't really, you know, you can squ- quibble all you want about the uh, fundamental differences between the two parties. But as George Galloway says, they're both two arses of this. Two cheeks of the same bloody arse, as far as I'm concerned. We're going to take a quick um, break for some promos, and we'll be right back. Stay tuned for the last half hour of The Long Way Round. Hi, I'm Gregory McCullough from Beyond the Four Walls. Hi, I'm Joy McVeigh from One Hope Community at Clinton Avenue Church. And I'm Brent Felker from the Art Society of Kingston. We all maintain outdoor refrigerators of free food for everyone. All community members are encouraged to... Give food and take food. The community fridge at 14 Van Buren Street is open from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. This kind of sharing and mutual aid strengthens our community and it deepens our connection with each other. The Blue Fridge at 122 Clinton Avenue is open every day from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Our fridge is at 97 Broadway and is open 24 hours a day. Be sure to label any homemade meals with all ingredients and the date you made it and package them in one to two meal servings. We love sustainable packaging if it's available. All food is welcome at the fridges and staples like milk, bread, eggs, yogurt, and cheese are always in demand. Radio Kingston, many voices. Muchas voces. Many voices. One community. Hi, it's Nick Pankin. Join me Tuesday nights at nine for Freedom Highway. The arc of history is long, and it's filled with song. The voices still calling across the years. Humans have always used music to unify and amplify our struggles for freedom. And now we got a revolution, cause I see the face of things to come. Do you ever wonder where the protest songs of today are? We take all we want from black culture, but will we show up for black lives? We'll explore the roles that music plays in shaping the movements that aim to shape our world through interviews, conversation, and lots of great music. Freedom Highway, Tuesday nights at 9, here on Radio Kingston, AM 1490, FM 1079, or anytime at radiokingston.org. And Ocean's 8 Films is hosting a screening of Windship at the Hudson River Maritime Museum Wednesday, Wednesday, September 28th. When ship follows the schooner Apollonia, the country's only delivery vessel to run exclusively on wind energy and her crew over the course of the past three years as they set sail carrying deliveries of lumber, corn, malt, CBD products, a printing press, hot peppers, organic pillows, and more, all without the use of any fossil fuels. 
The screening will be followed by a Q&A with the boat and film crews and Radio Kingston's own John Bauer Master from the Green Radio Hour. The event is free and open to the public. Wind shipped Wednesday, September 28th at the Hudson River Maritime Museum, which is 50 Rondout Landing in Kingston, New York, USA, the world, Turtle Island. Doors open at 6 p.m. Film begins at 7. And as promised for the last oh, 25 minutes or so, uh, Professor Wolf had sent me a list of uh, music that uh, we could play during the interview, but <laughs> we, we, with all that uh, conversation, we didn't get really much chance to, to, to play any music. And I even skipped playing the uh, Marseillaise. So I'm going to play that first. But uh, Rick, I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to play any of the Bob Dylan tracks because unfortunately what happens with those is uh, YouTube um, blocks my videos whenever I, for some odd reasons, only ever happens mostly with Bob Dylan material. Uh, my my YouTube video postings get um, blocked and I can't can't show them. So must be some publishing issue there, I suppose. Bob wants all his money. Anyway, love you, Bob. This is the Marseillaise, performed by the uh, some French people, Les Honneurs Français, in honor of Rick Wolf. <laughs> Oh. 
Digesting Reader's Digest In the back of a dirty bookstore A plastic flag with gum on the back Fell out on the floor Well, I picked it up and I ran outside Slapped it on my window shield And if I could see old Betsy Ross I'd tell her how good I feel But your flag, the gal, won't get you Into heaven dirty little war now jesus don't like killing no matter what the reason is for and your flag cow won't get you into heaven Club will give you ten of them flags for free. Well, I didn't mess around a bit. I took him up on what he said and I stuck them stickers all over my car and one on my wife's forehead. But your flag cow won't get you into heaven anymore. They're already overcrowded from your dirty. Side of curve, 
I was already dead And I'll never understand Why the man Standing in the pearly gate said But your flag the cow won't get you Into heaven anymore We're already overcrowded From your dirty little war Now Jesus don't like killing No matter what Into heaven anymore. You have reached the very end 
land when leaden skies a bitter future may portend for sure the hour for which we end will yet arrive and our marching steps will thunder we survive for sure the hour for which we end will yet arrive and our marching steps will thunder we survive not late but blood inscribed this bitter song we sing tis not a caroling of birds upon the wing but twas a people midst the crashing fires of hell that sang this song and fought courageous till it fell but twas a people midst the crashing fires of hell that sang this song and fought courageous till it fell so when it came all us to gaze to blitz and fig Then the himmel and blind of our shell and blow a tig While come in vet noch unser oist gebengt a shaw And stet a poik ton unser trot mir sein in da While come in vet noch unser oist gebengt a shaw And stet a poik ton unser trot mir sein in da Geschrieben ist das Lied mit Blut und nicht mit Blei. Es ist nicht ein Lied von Sommer Feigl auf der Frei. Das hat auf Volk zwischen Fahlen die Kalend. Das Lied gesungen mit einer Gamme sind die Händ. Das hat auf Volk zwischen Fahlen die Kalend. Das Lied gesungen mit einer Gamme sind die Händ. The people's flag is deepest red, it shrouded off the mass of day. And there the limbs grew stiff and cold, their hearts blood died in every fold. Then raised the scarlet standard high, beneath its folds we'll live and die. Though cowards flinch and traitors sneer, we'll keep the red flag flying here. It witnessed many a deed and vow We mustn't change its color now Raise the scarlet standard high In its folds we'll live and die So cowards flinch and traitors sneer We'll keep the red flag flying here It will recall the triumphs past It gives the hope of peace at last the banner bright, the symbol plain of human rights and human gain. Raise the scarlet standard high, in its folds we'll live or die. Though cowards flinch and traitors sneer, we'll keep the red flag flying here.
time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. It's been too. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes it will. I go to the movie and I go downtown. Somebody keep telling me don't. But I know a change gonna come. Oh, yes, it will. Then I go to my brother. And I say, brother, help me, please. As we come to the end of the show, I thank you, the listeners, dear listeners, for your time and attention. And I hope that you uh, learn as much doing listening to the show as I learn doing the show. It's always an adventure. Uh, and there was a special track in there, uh, Geokasson. It was your birthday track from, uh, who was that? Uh, Juanita Bird birthday song from the album Water's Life. Anyway, if the good Lord's willing, the creek don't rise. We'll see you next week.